Some of you don't open up Bibles. Some of you turn on Bibles. And so we, we have that on our devices, and I welcome you to do that as well. Great. Thanks for singing, too, by the way. Great shouts of praise to the Lord. It's tremendous. It's a wonderful time of the year to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ and to um, be a witness in our communities. Are you putting up those decorations and doing all those kinds of things with everyone out, else out in the neighborhood? It's a, a time in which we can interact with them. Sandy and I have been doing that more and more as uh, we get outside the house. It's a tremendous thing. Well, as I've said already this morning, hope is a powerful word. It is our first theme of the Advent season. And I came and looked at this Psalm 33, and um, it, it ends with a word of hope. And I want us to take a look at it today to see what the Lord is teaching. And then, quite frankly, I have a very practical word of application to the church by way of a word of hope. So look with me, would you please, at Psalm 33. Hope has, I know the, the bulletin started out just eyes, but as I was digging in more and more into the study, I noticed that there are more senses, that is one of the five senses, being illustrated in this psalm. And so I changed it in your worship guide there to hope has senses to see the future. I realize C is one. Don't strain at the gnat here. Shout for the Lord. Shout for joy in the Lord. O oh, you righteous, praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with your harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Now this psalm is a psalm right off the bat you can see of praise. It's a, it's a gathering together. It's a, an exclamation to invite the throngs of people to come together and to praise and to shout to the Lord. The question is why? And to be quite frank and right out of the, of the, of the, of the gate, we don't know. There may be some clues in the psalm to help us. There's quite a few metaphors of military action. Um, you can see these things by taking a look at uh, down in verse 16 and 17. 17 particularly, the war horse is a false hope. And so throughout this, there are inklings, little indicators, that maybe this is a psalm dealing with some kind of military action. Other places, it's talking about um, the song of the river. And, and maybe this is hastening back to the time of fleeing from Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and um, the, the, the celebration that happens there in Exodus. Because... Uh, the song of Miriam comes in the book of Exodus after they cross the Red Sea, and it's a large chapter of praise and worship to see what the Lord God has done in delivering us from the horse and the rider because they've been thrown into the sea, into the Red Sea. Maybe that's it. It's difficult to know, and I don't want to push it, but at times that kind of context could help us to understand what the psalmist is talking about. Shout for joy in the Lord. I like that. Do you see what it says? I mean, some of these small words are just so important that if I pick them out all the way through, it would take too long. But I want us to see this right off the bat because we're going to finish with this same thing. Remember that when I say we're going to finish with this same thing. Because you see what it says? Shout for, shout for joy to the Lord. Is that what it says? Shout for joy to the Lord? Look closely. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that. It says shout for joy what? in the Lord. Shout for joy in the Lord. That is that uniting of our spirit with his spirit. If we know that we belong to him, we belong to Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so we shout for joy in the Lord. O righteous ones, 
Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Oh, I like that. Smacks of the, the book of the Revelation of John, the last book, when one day we will sing a new song. We will sing a new song because we are in a new place and a consummation of our salvation. At this point, he's saying, sing a new song to the Lord. Play skillfully. I like this. You know, I could never do Keith's job. I just couldn't do it. Uh, I don't know that I could, uh, you, you know, you may not know this, but from time to time, people think they can sing and they can't. You've watched those TV programs, haven't you? And you wonder in your mind, why is it somebody doesn't love this person enough to say, please don't go on national television, <laughs> you know, please don't do that in front of other people, you know. Look what it says, play skillfully on the strings with the loud shouts. I praise God for the team that we have and the quality that God has given us. And, and to put our best foot forward in praise. Now, and, and just rejoice that you can't hear me because I'm down in front singing this way. And, uh, but play skillfully. I like that in there. But now look, the desperate sound of the world, as I've already said, is often quiet if, if heard at all. But hope shouts for joy. I don't want to bring a damper. I want to make this point move as quickly as I can. And yet, I'm very mindful that the holidays do bring in a great deal of discouragement, depression among people. The suicides are up during this time of the year. Do you know that it ranks third among young people, 15 to 24, and fourth among the age group just up from that? Suicide. And and uh, the research has shown that so many, many times, I know there's, you, we're told to look for the indicators. Watch your child. See if they're doing something different, unordinary. They're spending more time in the room. They're doing these kinds of things. And you should. You should watch those warnings for sure. But the, uh, but the authorities are telling us, the psychiatrists and others are telling us, that often there's no signs at all. Often we hear testimonies from people, I never saw that coming. I didn't see that. And there's this quietness that's not good. And, and the world keeps that in there. But here the psalmist is telling us to shout. And this shout, in verse 4 and following, this shout, first of all, I want to introduce to you, is built on the character of God. This is not just shouting, but this shout is built on the character of God, the fourfold character of God. For the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his steadfast love, O oh Lord. Look at that. The, the, the shout, the shout of praise is not just anything. And you've heard me remark from time to time that when you look on these screens and you read these words, that these words, that we don't sing things that we don't believe they're based on our core values of understanding the word of God and God's great sovereignty and the desire that we have for others to come to know him. Those core values that we have in the life of this church are portrayed in the words on these songs and they are the very character of God. The word of the Lord is upright. It simply means that everything that God is and does is true and is without error, is totally infallible. What God does is right. We could pretty much stop right there. When's the last time you saw anything from the world that you took on face value? Did you watch a commercial? Did you hear a newscast that you said, oh, I know, that's exactly the truth? Why we live in such a pessimistic, negative atmosphere that the truth is we don't believe anything, and I'm not sure that we should. The Lord our God, when we sing praises, we shout for joy to him. He is right, and he is right all the time. 
and all his work is done in faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, unto me. Great is his faithfulness. Everything that he does is faithful. He loves righteousness and justice. Two words slightly different. Righteous being his character about his morality. Justice being that part of him that always makes right judgments. And finally his character is that his steadfast love. The steadfast love of the Lord is in all of the earth. God loves the world. God created the world and he loves it. And, and the eternal hope that we're emphasizing today is his eternal plan to create that to create that creation of all and of man and woman to be the, the, the pinnacle of his creation. And yet we crushed that in Genesis 3 and we fell. And since then and all the way through to the resurrection, Jesus Christ, God has been portraying and Jesus Christ to come and to ransom. Did you hear that song? To rescue us, to redeem us back to himself by taking upon the sins of the world. God has this plan. And, and according to this psalmist, it says that he is always faithful in everything that he does and his steadfast love is in all of the earth. When you sing Sing with the character of God. But secondly, take a look here. The shout of hope is built. The shout of hope is built on the word of God. See, he begins, the word of the Lord is upright. Now, I'm going to say more about the word of the Lord down below in this second point. But right here, I want you to see that this particular word is a word that still deals with his character character and that is it's a word of integrity in other words what God says perfectly matches with what God does what God says perfectly matches that's what, what the word integrity integral one oneness within God and so that the word of God so when we think about the, the shout for joy it's not any shout. It's built on the very character of God. It's built on the word of God that speaks of God's integrity. Secondly, and, and this for me is more about hearing. If you want to connect it to the senses, if you're shouting, it's because it's loud. And I know that we talk about how loud the music is and how soft the music is. And I know it's a balance between a lot of people. I, I say in, in the word of God, there's more shout. There's more shake the rafters. There's more let the earth and the universe hear of the joy of the Lord. But secondly, the voice. Now this is the speaking, so that was for me the ear. Secondly, the voice of the world is frustrated. Frustrated. But, but hope hope in the word of God the sure word of God is is our hope God speaks integrity but he also speaks a sure word he speaks integrity he speaks a sure word and break this down in your in your in your outline very quickly look what he says by the word of the Lord, heavens were made, so that it is the past word of creation. The past word of creation. Now, if you stay with me for just a second here, when we're considering this issue of hope, I begin to think about, in experience, how hope is built. Go with me for just a moment. How is hope built? Is hope built just by, say, sitting in a chair and just sitting there and hoping, 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 hoping. You know, I'm thinking that hope is not built that way. Uh, let's suppose at five foot six that I have a basketball in hand and, um, 
And, and I've got the basketball at the top of the key, for those of you who know basketball, out there around that circle. And in front of me are another nine people, somewhere the shortest one may be 6'2", the tallest one seven foot. I'm thinking about driving the lane and laying it up. How much hope do you think I have? <laughs> you know, um, the tallest I've ever been is five foot six, and I wasn't very good at, at basketball. But you know something? One time I tried that. Now, not against six, nine, seven footers, guys taller than me. Didn't think I had much of a hope, but you know what? I tried it. Guess what happened? Made it. Wow. And you know what that gave me? How is hope built? Hope is built to a certain extent on past performance. Look at the text. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. See the tenses in that? They're past. They're past tenses. And if, and I wish I could really launch out in this. I did as much research and it's not there. So I have to say if. If this is a praise of some military adventure, if this is a praise maybe like the, the nations, uh, including Israel, used to do in playing music of different kinds before a battle, if the general is in front of his troops and he's desiring to bring strength and hope for a victory to them, he's referring back to all that God has done before. The heavens were made by the breath. That word breath, ruah, is the same for the word used in Genesis chapter 1 for the spirit hovering over because the Hebrew word for breath wind or spirit is all the same word and it's the same word used here for breath. God is speaking and it comes to be and the Lord said and the Lord said and the Lord said and it was so. Wow. The past word of the Lord. Have you experienced that in your life? Have you received the word? Of, have you acted upon the word of God? and said, wow, look what God has done. That's how hope is built. That's how faith is built. But secondly, it's in the present as well. Look at verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. Now what is the tense? The, the Lord brings. He's bringing counsel to the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. Who's in charge right now? I mean, come on, folks. I don't want to go in that direction because there's too many illustrations out there. Every single day, do we not wake up and wonder whatever else is going to come across the news feed now? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And yet here, the Word of God says, if we have any hope, our hope is not in Washington. Our hope is not in political. Our hope is in the Lord. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. God indeed is in charge right now. Right. See, the past word gives us hope, the present condition gives us hope, and obviously the shout uh, of joy that we're looking for here, the future hope of generations and nations. Take a look further in verse 11. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. Now, where are we going? We've been past. We've been present, look, forever. The counsel of the Lord stands forever into the future. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he's chosen has his inheritance. God is in charge of the future. 
that past performance, that future control, excuse me, that present control, and that future expectation that he is the God forever. This is where our hope is. Can you imagine those people in the Old Testament? They were looking for their Messiah for literally thousands and thousands of years. Thousands of years. How many, how many, how many acts of discouragement can you imagine? How many battles would they go into? How many times did they cry out? I think, I think about the words of Hosea. I think about the words of Habakkuk, these prophets of God. God, where are you? I cry out to you and, 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 and I, you're nowhere. I can't hear you. Only to come back to a word of hope. That though the grass withers, the flower does not bud, yet I will trust in the Lord my God. I will hope in him. And their hope certainly in waiting for the Messiah was not in vain because indeed he came. Hope shouts for future joy. Hope speaks the sure word of the Lord. And the eyes of the world trust in love that cannot rescue. Remember what we sang, cannot rescue. But hope sees, even at a distance, the steadfast love of the Lord. Hope sees, even at a distance, the steadfast love of the Lord. Look at verse 13, would you? The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of men. Take, take a look at that. He sees all, I'm going to emphasize this. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits in thrones, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. Uh, when God's steadfast love, listen folks, and this happens in Reformed churches. This happens where people who embrace and love the sovereign grace of God as we do. But we need to be careful. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves the whole world. God loves every, every child. God's love of life. He loves every life, and every life has hope. Look at it again, just to make sure you see it in the text. The Lord looks down from heaven, and he sees all children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all inhabitants of the earth. doesn't say elect and non-elect. God's love goes out and observes all their deeds. God loves every life. And I'm so grateful for the ladies and their wonderful celebration of yesterday and celebrating Jesus' birth by valuing the sanctity of life and the fact that God loves every life. Take a look a little bit further in the text. The king, it says, the king in verse 16 is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. There's another word there. But again, there are true and false hopes that we need to recognize. We need to recognize these kinds of things in the world. I really like uh, Spurgeon's commentary on this. And so I, I want to read this to you. It's not actually Spurgeon himself, but he's actually quoting another one by, Joseph, by the name of Joseph Carl. And, and this is what Spurgeon writes about this psalm. He does not mean the weak horse. When he says, when he says that the earth is taking hope in the horses, the war horse is a false hope, it's a vain hope. Uh, Spurgeon writes in, in quoting, he does not mean of a weak horse, but of a horse of the greatest strength imaginable. Such a horse is a vain thing to save a man. Neither can he deliver any by his strength. And therefore, the Lord, when he promised great deliverances to his people, lest they should expect it by the strength of horses, saith, I will save them, I will save them by the Lord their God. 
And I will not save them by the bow, nor by the sword, nor by battles, by horses, nor by horsemen, as if he had told them to not look after the creature's strength to be saved by. A horse will be a vain thing to save you. I can save you, he says. I can save you effectually without horses, and I will. Folks, we live in a day in which we spend maybe one, call it two, max out three hours out of 168 fellowshipping together in this building, encouraging one another, being at one another's side. Hopefully you're in a small group. Hopefully you're in a Bible study. Hopefully you're meeting with other people during the week. But out of 168 hours in the week, we're here together for three hours. And the other 165 hours of the week, the world is pounding on you and pounding on you and pounding on you and saying that you are trusting in vain hope. Well, I turn it around and I will not trust in the horses of this world, but trust in the Lord our God. Where is your hope? Not in these false ways. So the last point is it. Where is your hope? Where is it? The location of your hope. Where is the location of your hope? Behold, the eye of the Lord is on him who fear him, on those who hope in, in his steadfast love, that he may deliver the soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help, our shield, for our heart is glad in him. Remember what I said at the beginning? Are we going to come full circle? Where is it? It's in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Think about that. I remember the song Sandy Patty sang when I first became a, a, a Christian. Uh, we praise you for more than just who you are, not just for what you've done, but for who you are. What is the greatest gift in our salvation? What is the greatest hope in our salvation? It is Jesus and the fact that we are with him, that we are in him, and one day be eternally fellowshipping face to face with the Lord our God. We're in Christ. That's where our eternal hope is. That's where the location is is the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end oh his mercies are new every morning great is thy faithfulness to me hope hope and we need each other to come alongside of each other to build each other up through prayer encourage one another because we get beat down over and over again. Church work is hard. I don't think I've ever said that for fear that somebody would say, oh, poor pastor, poor Keith, they got such a hard job. Pastoring is hard. There's no question about it. Spiritual warfare, physically, emotionally I'm not discouraged I stand before you today more hopeful in the life of this church more hopeful in the life of this church than ever before God is God is being God God is being faithful He's not doing it fast <laughs> He's not doing it fast Maybe that's so that we will wait upon him some more and some more and some more. I look out and see Chris Chandler. He hates for me to say his name because he just humbles himself before God about what God's doing in the life of children. The Iwana program's bigger this year. It's not all about numbers. It's about faithfulness. More workers there. Praise the Lord for that flip side I don't, I don't know 
got 80, 84, 85 kids in Awana on Wednesday night. I don't know. I haven't counted lately, so I probably shouldn't speculate. I'm not sure we have 20 or 25 on Sunday morning. Uh, I'm very grateful that the way uh, we're using the facility today, I'm told by Boca Helping Hands that somewhere in the neighborhood of 640 families are now coming to our church to get a bag of groceries four days a week. Grateful for that. Been told by the Bible Study Fellowship, the women who come here, that this is the highest attendance that they've had, and they're incredibly grateful to be able to use our building. They have 327 women now studying the Bible here on Wednesdays. Many of you ladies participate, I know that, and uh, that's wonderful. If a lost person comes to know the Lord in our fellowship and says, where do I go, what class do I have that teaches me how to read the Bible? Or um, is there a small group that will help me learn how to pray? Or how do I discover how God wants to use me? Where, where's that class? We don't have it. We don't have it. Um, we've got some serious, serious holes. You know, I, I don't know what I would expect if I came and said, okay, Bill, Sarah, those are names picked out of a hat. Your name is Bill and Sarah. Don't worry about it. Talk to me about the gospel. If, if your neighbor knocked on your door and said, you know, I heard that you were a Christian and I've come to find out what that means, how many of you feel really equipped to just, wow, what an opportunity. I'm ready to draw that gun and fire right away. How many of you feel equipped Many of you do, I know. Many of you don't. Where do we teach that? How do we learn that? Uh, we've got a children's wing. I'm so very, very grateful for Brenda's work back there in the nursery. She's been doing it for 35, 40 years. Very faithful, the epitome of it. We've got a facility just above where Brenda does her work that looks like it was put together in 1952. It has holes in the floor, and uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe we painted it last year. I, I'm not sure. We've done some things. We need to do a lot. I, I call the youth room where the youth go the ghetto. Uh, exposed lighting, tiles, just different things that are happening there. I'll stop only to say, wow, Pastor, <laughs> I thought you started that out by saying you have greater hope right now than any time in the life of this church. <laughs> I do. And that's not spin. I will tell you why. I will tell you why. Why do I have hope? First and foremost, that right there. I will shout. I did shout. I stood down here, I'm sure... The team wishes that I wouldn't sing quite as loudly as I do. I probably throw them off. But I tell you, shout to the Lord, for he is in control. He has spoken in the past. He controls the present, and he will bless the future. And I believe that. Amen. Absolutely. Secondly, and much further beyond that, the reason I have hope is because God has so structured the life of this church and your faithfulness to give us a financial foundation right now that we've never had before. We've got resources. We've got human resources and we've got financial. Do we have all that we'd like? No, we do not. Not close to it. But we have some. And we can use these resources the budget reflects a hike, a serious hike in local evangelism. The budget will express in the conversations that we'll have doing things to this facility so that families enjoy bringing their children 
We have in the budget plans for discipleship training so that people learn the word of God, learn what the gospel is, and learn how to go out and share that gospel with someone else. And more than that, I say more than that, maybe not more than that, but in addition to that, come back and tell us what happened when you did that. And we'll put them up there on that screen and we'll show you what God is doing and we'll track it and we'll be able to evaluate it and we'll celebrate it and we'll see what God is doing through discipleship and evangelism. We have a greater opportunity right now, certainly in the almost nine years that I've been here. At the beginning of the year, on the first Sunday in January, we will be right back in here. I pray that there will be twice as many as there were today, but I am very grateful for those of you who show up on the first Sunday of the month at 9 o'clock to bang on the gates of heaven and ask God to bend his ear and to be kind to us and to show his graciousness to us as we depend upon him in prayer. Hope, hope. I'm not discouraged. I'm not frustrated or depressed or anything. I'm like in the blocks, people. I'm in the blocks. Just go ahead and shoot the gun off and we'll go and we'll move out. There's nothing left to do but pray. God of hope, I pray that you, by your Spirit, would fill us with the joy of the shout. I pray that you would speak through your character and your word. I pray, God, that you would demonstrate your steadfast love upon us. that we would be found faithful with all that you are in us. And we will not trust in the war horse. But we will trust in the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth, the redeemer of our souls. God, I pray for this congregation, for the unity of the Spirit, that you would cause them to so be in love with you. They are moved by the obedience of faith to respond in every way, in every way that you call us to take the gospel to a place called Boynton Beach. In Jesus' name.